So we have in, in this session then um, an introduction to what we really mean by large simple trials. Uh, we want to have a little discussion about the visions of how this would look in the health, learning health system uh, and what the advantages are and discuss some of the opportunities. To kick off this discussion, we have two presentations. Uh, one uh, on the vision for LSTs by Dr. Michael Lauer, who is a division director at the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. Uh, Michael came to the NHLBI from the Cleveland Clinic where he led a research laboratory. And he clearly is one of the innovative thinkers at NHLBI about where we're going to go with respect to clinical research. The second speaker is Dr. Ralph Horwitz, who is currently the senior vice president at GlaxoSmithKline. He had uh, earlier careers in, in, in academia, being a, a chair of a department of medicine at Stanford, and then um, a dean of the uh, School of Medicine at Western, Case Western Reserve. So Ralph is going to lay out what he views as some of the opportunities for large, simple trials in the electronic health record system. So with that general introduction, we will try to uh, reserve questions till the Q&A piece, but if there's a real burning question for clarification, uh, please uh, uh, ask it after the speaker uh, finishes. But otherwise, we'll try to have uh, our questions in the Q&A period. We have set aside plenty of time for that if we stay on time. So with that, I'm going to ask uh, Michael Lauer to come forward and, and give his, uh, share his thoughts. So you can do it from here, Michael, or you can, whatever, whichever you want. This guy is just forwarding it. Right. Thank you. Those lights will blink. Good afternoon and uh, welcome. And we're absolutely thrilled that uh, you're here today for what we hope is going to be a really interesting and uh, exciting conference. So uh, to talk about a vision, let me start with uh, 1976. Uh, this is the uh, Kodak Instamatic uh, camera. I, I actually got one here. How, how many of you had one at some time in your life? Almost everybody here uh, in the room. Um, in 1976, Kodak was selling 85% of cameras and about 90% of film. They were a king of the hill. And in fact, for people who didn't have Instamatic cameras but had fancier cameras, even they were dependent upon Kodak. Um, this is a uh, Leica, 35-millimeter Leica. This was my father's camera. It was one of his um, most precious possessions. It took absolutely gorgeous photographs. Um, but it also required film. It required, uh, uh, and, and the big film would, would uh, handle 36 exposures at any one time. And I remember Dad was very excited about that, that he could get, take that many pictures all at once. Well, in 1976, at the time that Kodak was ruling the world, uh, one of their engineers invented the digital camera. This was a camera that could take pictures without film. His name was Steve Sasson, and he talked about how he presented this to senior management. And they said, uh, well, that's nice. It's uh, filmless photography. It's cute, but please make sure that nobody uh, finds out about this because this will destroy our business model. And so as a result, this never went anywhere. And uh, then um, uh, the... Um, Problem, one of the problems with, uh, with this kind of photography was that it took clearly inferior pictures. So this is one of the first pictures that was taken with a digital camera on the right there. You had to use this uh, special device. Uh, and you know, when, you, when, I, when, I see, when I hear people talk about how electronic health data are inherently inferior to the data that's obtained through the, our normal routes of collecting data, and I'm sure this is going to come up over the next two days, this is the image to keep in mind, uh, a clearly inferior for, um, technology and therefore a, te a technology to ignore. And, th and that was the, uh, uh, the attitude that um, Kodak took. And um, they paid the price. Uh, earlier this year, Kodak declared bankruptcy. And uh, as Forbes magazine wrote, there are few corporate blunders as staggering as Kodak's missed opportunities in digital photography, a technology that it invented. This strategic failure was the direct cause of Kodak's decades-long decline as digital photography destroyed its film-based business model. And in fact, I would guess that many of you have cameras that are similar to those that are upper, in the upper right-hand corner there. And in fact, um, I take a lot of pictures with this. 
which isn't even a camera at all. It's a telephone. And uh, with this, I'm able to take much better pictures um, than I could ever take with this. And furthermore, I can send out my pictures to uh, my relatives and friends uh, all in, in no time uh, at all. So this is actually not unique to Kodak. So although the, this uh, article was very damning of Kodak's um, approach, um, in fact, this is a, uh, a remarkably common problem, which is that uh, large companies or large entities like the NIH um, have difficulty dealing with innovative or disruptive technologies. And it's an actually inherent uh, within their own structure. And this was very nicely described uh, by Clayton Christensen. So this is a traditional way of thinking about how technologies advance over time. Um, on the uh, x-axis, you have time. And on the uh, y-axis, you have performance. And let's say you have a, an old technology. Uh, the old technology, uh, say, might be this. Um, and it gets better over time, and it eventually it reaches a plateau. And then what happens is somebody figures out a better way to make this, a better Instamatic camera or a better film, and that's the new, and eventually that takes over. But ultimately, the model is still the same. The model is still going from one kind of film to another kind of film, and Kodak is still in business. Um, the problem is, is, is when the, uh, the new technology which is the initially inferior technology, comes from a completely different uh, way of viewing the world. A completely different way of viewing the world might be filmless photography. Or it might be using data that's obtained as part of routine clinical care uh, within the context of clinical trials. And the establishment doesn't like it. Uh, this is not part of their business model. And it's not something that their customers are particularly interested um, in working with. And so therefore, they ignore it. Uh, and uh, it's then assessed by a completely different metric and a different market. Now, eventually what happens is, is that that new inf the inferior technology uh, being worked on in a different market will, uh, will improve. And it will eventually improve to the point where, where it will start to erode the, uh, let's say, the lower levels of the mainstream market and then eventually get into the main market itself. Well, by the time that happens, um, it is developing so rapidly that the, the old market, Kodak, can no longer respond. So you have uh, a totally different set of technologies developing there on the right. The old clunky digital camera, and then the newer digital cameras, and the digital SLRs, and now cameras that are in telephones. And um, the, uh, they completely wipe out the old technology of Kodak because Kodak simply hasn't been paying attention. And this is something which has been described in many, many industries. So let's take a look at clinical trials. What is the standard business model? We might call that the Kodak business model or the Instamatic business model. Uh, most of our trials uh, have small numbers of subjects, but they have huge budgets. And by huge budgets, we mean the, the amount of money we spend per patient in the thousands of dollars, tens of thousands of dollars. I've even seen proposals in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, the endpoints are primarily surrogate endpoints. They're not clinical endpoints. Um, and when they are used clinical endpoints, it uh, requires uh, adjudication. And the setting takes place within a research enterprise, and Dave just described this, uh, where high-grade data are created uh, in this parallel universe. Some, it's a term that uh, Rob Caleb likes to use that's heavily audited and uh, monitored. What might a, uh, a new model look like? Well, a new model um, like this, just like Kodak digital camera was invented in 1976, the new model is actually something that we have at least in part seen before. Um, this is the GISI trial. A number of you may be familiar with this. Uh, this was a trial that uh, was very simple and large. It was done in northern Italy. Uh, it involved about 12,000 patients uh, with acute myocardial infarction who were enrolled in less than 17 months at a cost of 30 euros per patient. A, a, a tiny, tiny cost, and it had an enormous impact uh, on cardiovascular medicine. And uh, there are um, some other examples, and these are some more recent examples of some um, disruptive, what we'll call disruptive technologies. Uh, one is the idea that clinical trials ought to be practical, that they should inform uh, those uh, questions that investigator, that, um, that patients and clinicians and policymakers have in mind. It's a nice paper that Sean Tunis, uh, Carolyn Clancy, and Dan Stryer published a few years ago. 
Then another neat idea, and, and perhaps something that we'll talk about a little bit during the next couple of days, is the idea of folding trials into existing clinical registries. Uh, this is a, a study called TASTE. Uh, it is a 5,000 patient trial that's being done in Scandinavia, uh, where uh, patients with acute MI are, are being randomized to one kind of intervention or another. Uh, all the data that's being collected for this trial, or nearly all the data that's being collected for this trial, comes from existing registries. Uh, and so as a result, the cost of this trial is uh, exceedingly small. And given the size of the trial, we know that it's going to yield a, uh, a meaningful uh, outcome. Uh, another disruptive technology um, are uh, patients. Uh, patients themselves want to be uh, at center stage. And one area where we have seen this work out very well is in the area of rare diseases. Uh, here's one example, uh, LAM, a very rare disease that um, affects primarily women. And um, <coughs> there was a foundation that was formed by the uh, mother of a patient uh, with LAM. Uh, and this uh, eventually led to a, uh, to a trial. Now, the interesting thing about this is, is that here was a case of patients um, driving the agenda working in, in concert with, um, with researchers. And I have to say, when I see this, I say, well, why does this only have to happen with rare diseases? Shouldn't this also be happening with common diseases as well? This was a trial. Uh, it was a trial that was uh, funded by uh, NIH and, and industry and FDA, uh, uh, looking at the use of sirolimus in patients with this particular disease that largely affects the lung. Um, and uh, the trial actually did show some, uh, some real improvement. This was one of the first cases where there was some improvement in this particular disease. So let's think about what some of the newer models for, uh, for clinical trials might be. The, you might call it the telephone trial, uh, telephone model. Uh, the uh, size would be both bigger and smaller, uh, bigger in the sense that we would be enrolling huge numbers of patients. And uh, therefore, we would be able to get robust estimates of treatment effects and also we can look at subgroups uh, with some degree of confidence because the subgroups themselves will be very large. Um, however, the budgets will be very small. The cost per patient uh, will be exceedingly low, and that's because we leverage existing resources and we streamline the designs themselves. Uh, the endpoints will focus on what really matters. Uh, and so these will be patient-oriented endpoints, and, and perhaps with minimal or and perhaps even no uh, adjudication. And this setting will occur within what we'll call an increasingly integrated world, within the setting in which clinical care actually takes place. And um, ideally, we would see a world where every single patient, unless they have a, a, a trivial curable condition, um, every single patient will be enrolled in a clinical trial. And unless we got a cure for the disease, there really should be no excuse why a patient is not enrolled in a clinical trial. We should have so many clinical trials going um, that we will be able to generate answers relatively quickly because it will be the expectation uh, within our world that um, every patient will be, uh, will be in the trial. And they'll be involved in the trial not just as subjects but also as partners in helping it actually happen. Um, now, Clayton Christensen talks about ways in which we can overcome many of the inherent barriers for developing disruptive technologies. And in this case, we'll say a large, simple trial is a dis in, in this country certainly would represent a disruptive technology. So how do we do that? Well, as much as possible, we leverage those resources that we already have available to us. Uh, the second is, is that we create um, lots of small sub-organizations, or you might say relatively small, small in terms of budget. Uh, small um, operations that are politically and, if possible, financially isolated um, from the mainstream. And therefore, their metric for what constitutes um, a real win would be different from what the mainstream market would see. And that means that we should be willing to fail uh, early, uh, fail often, but most importantly, fail inexpensively. And by doing that, we can then move on and figure out what models actually work. Um, and then another critical part of this is to look for um, new markets. Um, and new markets means that uh, we should be looking at different groups of people who have not been part of the traditional uh, establishment for, uh, let's say, in this case, um, doing, uh, doing clinical uh, trials. So um, final thoughts here. Uh, 
just like uh, Kodak invented the digital camera back in 1976, and so they had the opportunity to be there but, but didn't take advantage of that, in some respects what we're talking about today is, is going back to the future. We have seen large, simple trials. They have been done. They've been done exceedingly well, but somehow they've been forgotten. Uh, and uh, ultimately what we're looking for are trials that are huge, that are pragmatic, that are inexpensive, that are very inexpensive when looked at upon a per-subject basis, and that are directly integrated into uh, medical care and public health. And so what we hope for in this particular meeting is to think about ways in which we can, uh, we can leverage the digital revolution, uh, think about ways in which we can integrate clinical trials directly into clinical care, uh, think about different kinds of markets that we can bring in to the clinical trial um, enterprise, and think about ways in which we can experiment um, and, and experiment in inexpensive ways um, to learn about what might work and what might not work um, to make this all happen. And, and ultimately, um, Mike McGinnis has talked a lot about the learning healthcare system. And what I see as the learning healthcare system is a system in which every single patient and every single clinical encounter is either an invitation to participate in a new clinical trial or a follow-up of an ongoing clinical trial, uh, because it is through the process of clinical trials and clinical experimentation that we ultimately come up with the best answers to our uh, vexing questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Are there any quick questions or clarifications, or otherwise we'll move on to our next speaker and then have uh, questions in the Q&A? Okay, so the next speaker is Dr. Ralph Horwitz, who is going to talk about opportunities. There we go. So uh, thank you, and it's a great pleasure to follow Michael, who, as usual, has laid out a very compelling uh, story for the advantages of large, simple trials. And listening to him, I was reminded of that uh, quote from Niels Bohr that uh, science advances one funeral at a time. Uh, I'm just hopeful that Michael will not be waiting for mine at the end of my remarks. Uh, <laughs> so uh, challenges and opportunities. I should start out by disclosing that I am employed by GlaxoSmithKline. As a result of some comments I've made at previous meetings like this, uh, GSK has asked that I begin every session with the following <laughs> comments, the views are mine alone and not necessarily those of the GSK. Uh, I am now apparently in a safe harbor. Um, so we all know the case for uh, LSTs. Uh, trials of promising treatments with important but small to moderate treatments need to be really large. And the trials that use death as an endpoint, <coughs> trials that use death as an endpoint can have simple follow-up and very simple adjudication procedures. Because treatment differences in the direction of effect are really quite uncommon, and differences in magnitude are likely to be equally distributed between group LSTs can have cheap, fast, and simple enrollment. And really large trials, therefore, can have really simple analysis. And because busy clinicians need to implement whatever regimen is being proposed, the LSTs need to have very simple interventions so that uh, each of these are, in a sense, an expectation of uh, rationally designed uh, LSTs. Now, um, it is almost axiomatic that we are expected to identify both the challenges and the opportunities. And because we're so politically and uh, uh, balanced in the way in which we prevent, uh, present things, I thought it was important to indicate that we will be talking here about the challenges, those challenges and opportunities that fit into equal balance uh, as we think about uh, these uh, studies. So I want to comment briefly on four areas that I hope we can address in part as we make our way through the next uh, day and a half. One, the external validity of uh, LSTs. Secondly, the uh, interest we have in treatment heterogeneity and how we can uh, take advantage of LSTs to address that uh, interest. 
the whole issue of medication safety or device safety and how that will be addressed in uh, large, simple trials. And then finally, uh, uh, I, um, I know I'm carrying calls to Newcastle here, but an emphasis on issues related to patient-reported outcomes. So what about this issue for external validity? On the surface, of course, you would, uh, we think of LSDs as having greater uh, external validity than the customary small, uh, precious uh, uh, RCTs that we customarily conduct. Uh, but LSTs are really designed for small treatment effects that have uh, important population benefits, but may have smaller individual uh, impacts. So is it possible that a very small benefit within an LST will not have a positive benefit in the intended target population? Uh, all trials, LSTs included, involve selection criteria, and patients meeting those criteria may suffer fewer side, side effects or have different response from the overall target population. So if we think for a moment, if I may follow up uh, Michael's uh, reference to GISI, one of the earliest, if not the earliest, uh, large simple trial, you're aware that, as he pointed out, it was a treatment uh, uh, trial for ischemic heart disease. 45% uh, of 43,000 subjects who had been admitted to the coronary care units of participating hospitals were randomized in the trial. Uh, but as many of you know, there was a, a series of companion studies that looked at patients who had been excluded from the uh, ra original randomized trial for all the usual and right reasons that they had clinical characteristics that made them ineligible. And in those companion studies, the mortality experience of the excluded patients was roughly twice that of the included subjects because the absolute risk reduction was 1.4 percent, not uncommon in many of the large simple trials that we seek to, uh, to promote. Uh, it's possible that a small positive effect in an LST trial population that is highly compliant and shows fewer immediate side effects will have a net negative effect in the target population where patients are only partially compliant, have more side effects, or unwanted adverse consequences. And so we do need to come to grips with this issue of uh, whether, in fact, uh, the external validity, the application of the results of large simple trials will achieve the intended benefit that is observed in the uh, design of the original study. It's not a reason not to do these trials, but it is a reason to think about what the individual effect is and whether the population net benefit is that uh, which was intended. So what about treatment uh, heterogeneity? Uh, well, interestingly, in some of the early uh, uh, justifications for conducting LSTs, this idea that treatment heterogeneity uh, is not likely to strongly influence the design of the trials was one of the strong motivators. We are not worried that uh, treatment responses are likely to go in a direction opposite to that found in the trial, and even quanti so-called quantitative uh, modification of effect within the trial is uh, likely not to be uh, a substantial problem. And so it was, uh, trials were designed with the idea that you could minimize data collection at baseline and during follow-up, and that that was actually a strength of the design. That was an advantage uh, of the trials. But all of us know, of course, that Looking at treatment heterogeneity is one of the things that we most often seek to find within the trials. And so we do want to plan for how to uh, uh, validly and uh, efficiently look at this uh, treatment heterogeneity by collecting the relevant clinical and laboratory data. Now, if I were to look up in the dictionary the word whimsy, this is the definition I might expect. Uh, this is the uh, table that uh, has, is embedded in all of us as a result of the analysis of the ISIS-2 trial in which uh, the investigators, uh, perhaps fatigued by the constant request for subgroup analyses, offered one of their own, right? Uh, they uh, analyzed the uh, benefits of aspirin versus placebo in the ISIS trial by astrological birth sign. Uh, as you, all of you know, that uh, uh, in the overall trial, there was a, uh, a, a significant 
to the benefit of aspirin over placebo for patients admitted with acute myocardial infarction. But sadly, for those of you who may have been born under the sign Libra or Gemini, you could expect no actual advantage from that treatment uh, when they analyze the data according to these subgroups. Uh, fortunately, in the ten, is it 10 other signs in the uh, Zodiac, there was reason to believe that uh, benefit would be obtained. So, uh, so uh, I'm sure this was a whimsical uh, analysis on the part of our colleagues who conducted that trial, but it drove home the point of how commonly and easily we can be misled by subgroup analyses, which I would agree with, especially if they are motivated not by clinical biology, but by astrology. But I think that we actually have moved ahead very substantially to have a very strong scientific foundation now for the design of subgroup analyses that can be expected to be based on clinical biological foundation that uh, would create a, a pre-specified set of questions that are meaningful to answer, but re does require that we plan for data collection that enables relevant analyses. And a recurring theme of this afternoon and tomorrow will be the extent to which electronic health records, as they're currently constituted, enable that, uh, that planning, and how we move forward in the design of electronic health records so that we can capture the information that is relevant to support uh, the uh, LSTs in an ecological niche that is broader than what they might currently serve. We think about safety evaluations. This is one that uh, I think uh, we're going to have to pay particular attention uh, to. Uh, it's uh, assessment for safety, obviously, is a fundamental critical requirement in the pre-approval period for all medicines and in the post-approval period, increasingly, as part of our responsibility to ensuring the uh, safety as well as effectiveness of uh, medicines. We have highly choreographed strategies. Uh, for looking for safety risks in new medicines uh, according to a set of uh, procedures that have been well tested. So, you know, we have uh, lots of standardized approaches to look for hepatic toxicity and renal toxicity, and every new medication that is assessed for uh, its utility will have an assessment for QT prolongation. We have learned to look carefully under the lamplight for the things that we know how to search for. Um, and we have systematic approaches to uh, serious adverse events, including common ones such as hospitalization and rare ones such as Stevens-Johnson syndrome. We're good at looking for the things we know how to look for. But when adverse events occur with any new medicine, uh, detailed clinical data are inevitably required for regulatory review. And this is not just about regulatory review. It's about sound clinical practice, understanding the clinical context in which the adverse event occurred. And again, uh, those of us, uh, all of us who have worked with trying to understand that clinical context when an adverse event occurs knows how frustrating it is to try to go back into data that has been collected for other purposes to find the uh, uh, antecedent events that are associated with that adverse event if they have not been looked for systematically through a rigorous data collection uh, process. Uh, so it's important that we do not allow these kinds of issues to interfere with the development of LSTs, but it's also important that we figure out how to suitably assess safety uh, for new medicines and devices that are being evaluated uh, in the healthcare marketplace. And then uh, uh, the final uh, uh, topic, uh, area, I wanted to comment on concerns patient reported outcomes. And here, uh, where's Joe Selby? Uh, Joe is. So Joe and I had a conversation about this uh, earlier uh, this afternoon because we were talking about patient reported outcomes and it was easy to slip into the uh, mode of thinking of patient reported outcomes as those that are measured in a systematic way using standardized instruments that permit the assessment of uh, PROs within a sort of typical aggregated framework. Uh, but uh, I want to emphasize uh, the experience, uh, the patient reported outcomes as a reflection of a 
the experience of patients with a disease and its treatment. And that that experience is not captured well within the usual standardized measures that form the basis for such, uh, uh, for such uh, evaluations. And uh, we need to think about how to incorporate those into large, simple trials, making them efficient, but expanding their value for patients and physicians. Fortunately, new information technologies will assist. Uh, we can design and conduct such studies in uh, electronic health records, although we're going to have to figure out how to get better data, as Michael has suggested, than we currently get. We can conduct them outside of brick and mortar sites for research uh, using recruitment, consent, medication, follow-up uh, procedures that are not dependent on patients going to investigator sites for the information. Uh, there's a a group called MITRIS that is trying to pioneer such approaches. And we can incorporate methods and data of social media, like patients like me, to accelerate the emphasis on patient-reported outcomes. All of you know, well, all of you may be as disheartened as I am that the National Hockey League has canceled its season today. But those of you who know Wayne Gretzky, the so-called great one, know that he was asked what accounted for his greatness as a hockey player, and he said, uh, I always skate to where the puck is going to be. And uh, that is, I think, what we are seeking to accomplish here over the next day and a half, to figure out where LSTs are going to be in the next, uh, uh, few, uh, in the next few years. Um, we run the risk, of course, of turning large, simple trials into large, complex trials. And in fact, many of the studies that we sometimes refer to as large, simple trials are, in fact, large, complex trials. So the question for us is how to preserve the efficiency of those trials while increasing their value for clinical decision making by physicians and patients. We will be looking to these new research technologies and data, but more importantly, we'll be looking to all of you for fresh ideas for how to do so. So thank you very much, and I look forward to your comments.